How has genetic diversity in humans evolved in response to pathogen selection? Why have humans adapted strikingly different strategies to combat two major malaria parasites? How are mathematical models being used to help us understand these processes? We explore these questions and more in this episode of Spider Presents. This is Spider Presents, a series produced by the Spider Podcast Hub. My name is Laura Guzman. And mine is Ed Hill. Today, we welcome Bridget Penman, Associate Professor in the School of Life Sciences and a member of the Zeeman Institute at the University of Warwick. Bridges has research interest in understanding how pathogen selection drives genetic diversity in humans and uses mathematical models and computational simulations of evolution to understand this process. We will be discussing the research article Adaptive Immunity Selects Against Malaria Blocking Mutations published in the journal PLOS Computational Biology in October 2020. This research was done in collaboration with Sylvain Gandon, researcher at the University of Montpellier in France, as part of the project. Welcome, Bridget. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. To begin, would you like to tell us a bit more about the overarching project and collaboration for this work? Okay, well, I guess the motivation behind the, um, the project in the first place is that we know that uh, malaria has had a profound impact on human evolution and hence human genetics. And malaria parasites have been making people seriously ill for thousands of years. The motivating factor was trying to understand the rules of how humans have adapted to malaria parasites. Because if we can understand those rules and the biological mechanisms behind human genetic adaptation to malaria parasites, then we'll know more about the fundamental biology of malaria. And the collaboration with Sylvain happened because I was making a presentation about my interest in malaria, and he was one of the audience members of, in the seminar, and then he suggested some cool ways we could analyse um, one of the models I was working on at the time. So it sprang from a kind of quite organic uh, meeting at, at, this, at this seminar. Well, that's excellent. And that also demonstrates how the kind of genesis of research uh, kind of happens like off the back of uh, research talks uh, exactly. attendance etc so that, that's brilliant yeah so quite chance encounters sometimes yeah so can this help us combat infectious disease oh how does this type of work help us combat infectious disease well it is quite a fundamental question we're trying to get at here so it's hasn't got such immediate translational impact but as perhaps we'll hear later so when I when I describe some of the results we have it leads on to future research questions that I hope will drive a deeper understanding of the malaria parasite itself and of course if we can understand the malaria parasite more deeply um, then who knows what kind of new treatments you could come up with once you have that deeper understanding. So off the back of that uh, in terms of this specific study, so adaptive immunity selects against malaria blocking mutations, what were the specific aims for this research? Okay, so um, I first need to explain a little bit more about malaria. And, Absolutely, go for it. <laughs> and the fact that there are more than one species of malaria parasite that can cause this disease. Now, the two most important species of malaria parasite of humans are called Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. Both of these can cause severe disease, but Plasmodium falciparum is widely regarded as the more severe of the two and the more likely to kill people. Humans have adapted to both of these parasites. They have evolved in response to both of these parasites. But there are important differences in the way that humans seem to have evolved. So there is a blood group called the Duffy negative blood group, which greatly reduces people's chance of becoming infected with Plasmodium vivax. And so I'm going to call this type of adaptation a infection-blocking mutation against Plasmodium vivax malaria. And there is strong evidence that this blood group went from a low frequency to a very high frequency in certain human populations in sub-Saharan Africa in the last 50,000 years. So that's why we're calling it an adaptation. It's a change that happened quite quickly in terms of evolutionary time, and our best explanation is it's a response to Plasmodium vivax malaria. But when we look at Plasmodium falciparum malaria, which, as I've mentioned, is the one that can cause more lethal disease, 
There's a range of adaptations, such as you may have even heard of something like the sickle cell mutation. There's a whole range of adaptations out there that humans have developed, which seem to combat falciparum malaria, but very few of those have any kind of blocking effect. And there are blood groups out there with the potential to block falciparum infection, but none of them have had the success that the Duffy negative blood group has had against Plasmodium vivax. So that's where I was coming from with this problem. The raw material is there for humans to have evolved to actually block falciparum infection, and yet we haven't, and instead have, ev have evolved what are arguably sometimes quite problematic adaptations. So sick the sickle cell mutation can cause sickle cell anemia when you inherit two copies of it. So why have we not taken an easier route to evolve adaptations against Plasmodium falciparum? Thank you for that deep dive overview. I think that's naturally an inherent, very complex problem, but I think that's very nicely described for us. So th thank you for that. With these specific aims in mind, how did you investigate the problem? Well, so this is where the collaboration with uh, Sylvain Gardon from um, the University of Montpellier, who you mentioned earlier, this is where it came in, because we set up an evolutionary epidemiological model, which simulates a human population infected with malaria, in which a malaria blocking mutation can arise. And we're interested in the fate of this blocking mutation, does it spread or not? The model assumes that the full infection blocking effect of this mutation is experienced if a person inherits two copies of this mutation, one from each of their parents. And someone who inherits just one copy of the blocking mutation will still experience some infection blocking, but not 100%. Okay, so that's an important feature of the model. The model also includes various realistic aspects of malaria biology, because for example, people become infected with malaria many times during their lifetime. And they don't develop what we call sterilizing immunity, which would prevent all infections, but they do develop immunity against the costs of malaria, against the severe malaria syndromes. So again, that was a feature of the model, repeated infection, but after a certain number of infections, resistance, well, immunological resistance to the costs of malaria. The model had all those features and we could vary its parameters and explore the circumstances when the blocking mutation would spread and when it wouldn't spread. And out of interest on the like, reinfections, is there kind of a typical number of reinfections one might expect or is it quite a very variable distribution? Well, I mean, this is going to depend hugely on the uh, general level of transmission in the region because there will be high transmission areas where people start experiencing infections as babies and are infected again and again through, throughout their lives effectively even though by the time they reach adulthood they've usually got so much immunity that they don't even get symptoms anymore but they can still have the parasites in their blood without having any symptoms so that's uh, what can happen in a very high transmission zone but of course the lower the transmission zone you can imagine there's a whole spectrum of where it's actually much much less frequent to get infected thank you for describing that for us following the overview for the methodological approach used what were the main findings from the study the key finding is that the rate at which you become immune to the costs of malaria directly impacts the success or not of the malaria blocking mutation and so if you can become immune to the costs of malaria quickly, after only a few infections, then a malaria blocking mutation, the malaria blocking adaptation, just won't succeed in the population and it won't evolve. Whereas if it takes a great many infections to gain that protective immunity against the virulent effects of the disease, then those are the circumstances when the malaria blocking mutation will succeed and can evolve. Because we obviously studied the model closely and why it did that, <laughs> we can give a further explanation, which is that it all has to do with the duration of your lifespan where you are protected by your immune system from the costs of malaria. So let's just imagine um, that you need to experience, say, five infections to gain immunity against the worst effects of malaria. Let's imagine person A who doesn't have any blocking mutation. They experience those five infections as quickly as it's possible to experience them within a person's lifetime. And once they've had their five, they're protected by their immune system and 
they can go on and have as many children as possible later on. You know, they're not going to experience any costs of malaria and, and malaria can have a reproductive cost as well, which perhaps I should have mentioned earlier in that that was a factor we incorporated into the model, the possible reproductive costs of malaria. Okay, so person A, who doesn't have a blocking mutation, gets protected really quickly by their immune system. Person B, who does have a blocking mutation, their infections are going to be more spread out throughout their lifetime because they're genetically resistant to some infections, but not all. And that can put person B at a disadvantage because if they're still experiencing their risky infections at a time of their life when person A is already busy reproducing as much as possible, person B might have some of those costly infections um, during the most reproductively active part of their life. And because, obviously, from an evolutionary perspective, the rate at which people reproduce is absolutely key to whether or not um, something is adaptive, this phenomenon means that the blocking mutation simply won't spread in that population where person B is experiencing those infections over a more spread out time period than person A. Thank you, that was a very clear explanation. What were the implications of these findings? Well, so if we return to my first question, which is why do humans seem to have adapted differently to these two species of malaria parasite? Well, our model suggests that you only expect to see a blocking mutation spread if immunity is gained quite slowly to the costs of malaria. It would perhaps follow that the parasite where there is no blocking adaptation or no significant blocking adaptation, that's Plasmodium falciparum, maybe immunity to the worst effects of Plasmodium falciparum is gained after only a few infections. And perhaps for Plasmodium vivax, it takes a great many infections to gain that full protection against its virulent effects. And as you can indeed read in the discussion section of, of the paper, because we probably haven't got time to go into all the evidence, but there are other studies who have concluded that immunity to Plasmodium falciparum, immunity to the really bad effects of Plasmodium falciparum, is gained after only a few infections. So I would argue that that phenomenon is basically why we haven't seen a blocking adaptation evolve to Plasmodium falciparum. With that corroboration of other study findings, so were those other studies more like a laboratory or experimental based rather than a kind of modeling based study or were they also modeling based studies? Uh, it's a combination. So it's about the observation of, say, for example, the age distribution of certain severe syndromes, or it's also about observing what happens when um, people who have never been exposed to malaria before uh, migrate into a region where uh, there's a lot of malaria and you can compare those new arrivals with the people who've lived in the region for a long time. And by looking at the different ways in which all these groups of people respond to the, the two different parasites, one can come up with, well, one can speculate about the differences in the way immunity to each are gained. But the other thing to say here is, this is an ongoing question of research, like how exactly immunity to the severe effects of these parasites um, is gained is not, a, not has not been completely ironed out yet. And this might well demonstrate this, the value of different forms of studies then offering their own insights and then bringing them all together. Absolutely. Building absolutely. a, helping build the overall knowledge base. I so absolutely I agree, that, yes. I think that's really nice to see. Is there other research having similar findings in other pathogens? Wow. Okay, that's a, that is really interesting. And... To be honest with you, I actually, I don't know, I don't know of such research. Um, so malaria and humans and human adaptation to malaria is actually a really sort of slight, somewhat special case because human genetics is so well studied and malaria has been such a historically important pathogen of humans. So there really has been the opportunity for humans to adapt to malaria. Now, I'm certain that other, other species will have adapted to other pathogens, or indeed humans will have adapted to other pathogens, but there is the level of evidence that we have for specific adaptations that affect the way we respond to malaria, we simply don't have that evidence base or that amount of material to study for essentially 
any other system. But I would say from the from the theoretical theoretical perspective that I I I believe the findings of this model to be generalizable, absolutely. That's excellent. And horizon scanning moving forward what in your view would be like other important considerations and directions you'd like to take this research okay and so this uh, goes back to something we did we did mention earlier about like well it's all very well it's all an interesting question but does it actually have any real world application in terms of could could this ultimately help us fight malaria i've already mentioned that it, it highlights how a possible difference in the way that immunity is gained to the costs of these two different malaria parasites. But another really interesting thing that emerged as we did this modeling work is all about, well, so I said that there isn't a widespread blocking mutation against Plasmodium falciparum from malaria. But have we actually been looking in the right places to find adaptations to falciparum from malaria? Because you might think Let's look in the places where malaria selection is at its highest, and there we will, you know, the pressure for malaria is the strongest, and there we will find the most adaptation. But an implication of this model is that you're more likely to find a blocking mutation in the regions when transmission is relatively low. Because the benefit of having a genetic adaptation that stops you getting, that stops some of your infections, the benefit of that is greatest if infections are relatively few and far between. So in that situation, no one's getting affected often enough to gain protective immunity via via repeated infection. So anyone who can block those infections, they're going to be the ones with the advantage. Now, why would we bother going out and looking for these potential adaptations that might exist in human populations at the periphery of historical malaria spread? Well, if you find a new potential change in a human cell that has the potential to block malaria infection, well, you know, the implications of that are pretty obvious. And you might have discovered a new receptor that plasmodium falciparum needs to get into red blood cells. And the more of those we can discover, the better. Something I'm very keen to do, although I haven't uh, yet necessarily got any, <laughs> any funding to do it or anything like that, but something I really want to do following on from this work is precisely that go and look at what's happening in human genetics in the populations whose ancestors were sporadically infected with malaria. So places where transmission was there, but not so constant. I've heard you have a postdoc role available related to this research. Yes, uh, and thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. So I am recruiting a postdoc at the moment. It's not it's, it's not immediately related to this research, but it is absolutely in the same field about um, the co-evolution of humans and pathogens. And Plasmodium falciparum malaria is very much a thing that I want to look at as part of this project. But the theme of the project for which I'm hiring a postdoc is about how pathogens spread in systems when we are simulating realistic human immune system genetic diversity. So that's a different kind of genetic diversity to that which I've just been describing, but the genes of the human immune system are extremely diverse, and we typically don't put that diversity into our models. So this project is all about putting that diversity into our models and then combining modeling results with pathogen and human genetic data so as to see uh, can we find further evidence of pathogen-human coevolution, and which... which, uh, for various reasons, I believe might be quite biomedically important. So yes, the deadline to apply is the 12th of July. So for more information, you can check out the job advert, which will be linked to via the Spider Twitter account. You can also uh, follow me on Twitter. That's Bridget Penman. And I've got a tweet about that. Um, And if you Google Warwick Bridget Penman, Zeeman Institute, you, you will also find my group page and the advert is there as well. That's a very exciting opportunity and so I wish, wish you all the best with the recruitment process oh, thank and, you. With, uh, and, and the growth of your research group. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yes, no, I'm, I'm excited about this as well. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for joining us today, Bridget. Well, thank you. Thank you again very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. This is our news section, where we'll give updates on events happening in the research group. Our first news item is a job alert. 
Applications are invited for a postdoctoral researcher in bioinformatics and computational biology to join Dr. Bridget Penman's team. This position is part of the project Predicting Infectious Disease Evolution in Light of Immune System Diversity. The project is funded by Bridget's Academy of Medical Sciences Springboard. The project is combining epidemiological models with pathogen genomic analysis to understand how human immune system genetic diversity shapes pathogen evolution and what this means for interventions to combat infectious diseases. The application deadline is Tuesday the 12th of July 2022. More news from June. We are pleased to announce that our colleague Glenn Guyver Fletcher has passed his PhD on investigating the efficacy of vaccine strategies in Turkey using a mathematical epidemiological model. Congratulations to Glenn! We also have a new postdoc who has joined us in Spider. Diana Mesa is working with Erin Gorshi, working on modeling diseases in Bighorn Sheep. And finally, a summary of events that Spider members have been attending and participating in. On Monday the 13th of June 2022, several postdocs from Spider participated in the Royal Society Conference modeling the COVID-19 pandemic, achievements and lessons. We also had Louise Dyson giving a plenary lecture in the evening public event on lessons from modeling the pandemic. Louise provided a personal view on the path from science to policy. Video recordings of both these events are available on the respective event pages on the Royal Society website. Then on Wednesday the 22nd and Thursday the 23rd of June, the Isaac Newton Institute, Newton Gateway to Mathematics, hosted an event at the Müller Institute, University of Cambridge, on modeling to support resilience for pandemics, open questions. The two-day event aimed to highlight and reflect on lessons learned from the modeling undertaken during the COVID-19 pandemic. Talks and discussions explore key epidemiological questions, how they may be answered, what are the models that fit these areas and how these can be used to build systems that will strengthen resilience for the future. We had four talks from Spider members. Matt Killing spoke on modeling outbreaks, models, data and policy. Anna Seal presented modeling for vaccine evolution, what needs to be done for next time. Ed Hill talked about incorporating behavior into models, challenges and questions. And finally, Louise Dyson on the SPI-M Sage route into policy, reflections and future planning. That's all from myself and Lara for this episode of Spider Presents. Thank you all for listening.